The Senate minority this year is, with renewed vigor and emphasis, uh, has an action plan to uh, try to, to do this, to empower uh, the people and let the people decide. That's what they've asked for. Uh, they came down to this capital in uh, greater numbers than ever before, and they left frustrated, annoyed, disappointed, and angry. And primarily they found out that they had very little power. Uh, we are the state that lacks total initiative, referendum, recall, or term limits. The only state that has neither of those tools. So the Senate minority uh, has an action plan to try to bring that about. Uh, I read a column by Mr. Bereka this morning uh, uh, poo-pooing the idea of constitutional change and saying how difficult it is. Of course, it is difficult, and I believe it should be difficult, but it is doable. And I think too many people in our community have given up, and part of the message of the Senate minority is don't give up. Um, we have the ability to make change. You've been promised change, and now it's up to those of us who you elected to keep those promises. So I basically ask the question, in this legislature, who speaks for the unempowered individuals in our community? Who speaks for child safety? Who speaks for the overburdened taxpayers? Who speaks for the independent businesses? And who speaks for the homeschoolers? And I would say only the minority in the legislature. We have spoken up consistently and constantly. We've had specific legislation and programs. Many of these uh, bills have not gotten hearings. This year I'm happy to say that a number of the bills have already gotten hearings. We're pressing to have more hearings and we are engaging the public to make sure that they hold our feet to the fire and that they require from the majority, the overwhelming majority in this building, that they do the right thing. Hold hearings, pass legislation that's going to help the people. So our specific package is, uh, the keynote is letting the people decide and empowering them because we think uh, not only, as I said earlier, that this is the right thing to do, the constitutional thing to do, but we're always worried about why we have slipped from number one to number 50 in voter turnout. And the answer is the people don't turn out because they don't feel that their vote counts, that anybody is listening to them, that they have any leverage. We want to change that and we want to make sure that we continually engage the public to do that. We're also very concerned about the lack of government transparency. More things that uh, go under the category of uh, exemption from Chapter 92, the Sunshine Laws, uh, more things that go uh, under confidentiality. The public has a right to know whether it's Pono choices or whether it has to do with fiscal implications, because it's the public that are always called upon to pay for all of these things. So we are going to uh, call for and uh, vigorously advocate for more openness in government and the release of government records. And for those of you in the media, the idea that you've been told in the past, yeah, you can get the documents, but you're going to have to pay for them. Parents who've been told, you want a copy of the curriculum? Yeah, but you're going to have to pay for it. You're already paying for it. All the taxpayers are paying for it. Now it's time to get uh, those documents and, and make them available. And then finally, we uh, are not going to just give lip service to child safety. We have many provisions that will ensure uh, child safety in this law, which unfortunately, whether we're talking about uh, sex trafficking or pornography or the abuse or actual assault and rape of children, it's a very sorry record. And it's a badly kept secret in this state. We talk about, we do everything for the children, but in fact we do not. And then educational reform. So what I would like to do at this point is call on several of our staff members to give you uh, snippets of these particular areas. And I call on our budget director, Mr. Paul Harleman, first to give you some ideas on fiscal reform and fiscal equality. Paul? I'm here to give you a brief overview of the fiscal bills that uh, has been introduced by the Senate minority this session. The following um, provides highlights of some of the broad uh, objectives that the Senate minority fiscal plan um, accomplishes. Number one, 
It provides $500 million in tax relief for working families by increasing the personal exemption amount for state income taxes, as well as by exempting food and medical supplies from the general exercise tax, also known as the GET. The state's personal exemption amount for income taxes has not kept up with inflation and is currently worth twice as less than it was 30 years ago. Senate Bill 3080 increases the personal exemption amount from $1,144 to $3,950, which is the current exemption allowed for federal income taxes. This proposal puts an, puts an extra $465 back into the pockets of Hawaii's working families. In addition, Senate Bill 2169 exempts food and medical supplies from the GET, which is estimated to generate an additional $450 in annual savings. This means that both measures combined are projected to reduce the annual cost of living for Hawaii's working families by a total of $915. Number two, it improves the business climate by exempting certain business-to-business -business transactions from the GET, as well as by repealing the corporate income tax. Hawaii currently taxes 157 different uh, business to business services. This is significantly higher than any of the 49 other states. That means that many products and services that small businesses are offering to consumers are often taxed at multiple stages of the production process. This does not only uh, distorts the business environment in Hawaii, but it also contributes to some of the high prices that we are seeing in our stores today. To provide tax relief for Hawaii small business owners, Senate Bill 2171 exempts the business to business transactions of tangible goods that are consumed as part of a regular business operation. To further improve the overall business climate, Senate Bill 2767 repeals the corporate income tax. Number three, it provides tax fairness by repealing the estate and inheritance tax, as well as by exempting Hawaii's residents from the transit accommodation tax, also known as the TAT. Currently, Hawaii is one of the few states that collects an estate and inheritance tax. These so-called death taxes are an unjust form of double taxation. If you have paid taxes during your life, it's not only unfair, but also cruel of the government to impose a tax on your assets upon your death. Since these taxes fail to generate a substantial amount of revenues for the state, Senate Bill 2963 proposes to repeal the state and inheritance tax. In addition, Senate Bill 2170 exempts Hawaii, Hawaii's residents from the TAT, which is a 9% tax that is currently imposed on hotel rooms, vacation rentals, and timeshares. Hawaii families are already burdened with many taxes and fees. This exemption provides relief by reducing the cost of in, inter-island travel and staycations. In 2013, 18 states have cut taxes. We hope that Hawaii will join these states in their efforts to reduce the cost of living for our working families and the cost of doing business for our small business owners. I would like to end by uh, stating that uh, in addition to these reforms, the Senate Minority Fiscal Package also includes uh, bills to improve fiscal transparency as well as to protect our taxpayers from excessive spending and taxation by the uh, legislature. Uh, that concludes uh, an overview of our Hawaii Senate Minority 2014 fiscal plan. Thank you. For 10 years now, every year, the uh, legislature uh, introduces a bill to conform state tax laws with the Federal Internal Revenue Service. And every year, they neglect to uh, change the things that benefit Hawaii taxpayers. I uh, have been very critical year after year about the fact that a Hawaii taxpayer uh, is treated as one-third of a citizen in comparison to the personal exemption. And the reason given why we don't do it? Oh, because it would cost too much money. Hey, we're always talking about equality 
in this building and in this community. We can start by showing real equality by treating people the same in Hawaii as we do nationally. So thank you very much, Paul. Uh, educational reform. This is part of um, Free Choice Education Week. And it's interesting because in this building, uh, you can't even use the dreaded V word, and that is voucher, which means choice for parents. Um, we talk a lot about educational uh, changes and reforms, and what we've seen is educational deform. We've seen more power sucked out of the uh, individual schools and educators and given to the Department of Education and to the state. We see less and less decision making by parents. We think true educational reform is needed, and I'm going to call on Kim Kepner Saborne to give us some highlights of our package. Kim? Hawaii's teachers and students have made progress this year. The fourth graders have scored above the national average for the first time. The eighth graders have made gains in reading and math. But as the race to the top money is spent locally, there are several educational issues that that raises. When that money comes down from the federal government and we spend it here, we are removing the power of individual schools. The autonomy of an individual school is affected when the Department of Education sends down the Common Core and directs them what resources, their school resources, need to be spent on the Common Core curriculum and assessments. So we are looking out for bills that are going to threaten individual school autonomy. We believe in the minority office that parents are the best equipped to make decisions for their children, including the educational setting that would best serve their children's interests and educational needs. So we're introducing uh, two educational bills. SB 2231 would set aside funds for low-income families uh, to make their choice among public and private schools. So low-income families could take their voucher and place their child in a public or private school of their choice that they think would serve their child's needs. It would no longer be only the families that could afford private school or to send their child to a specific public school because they can take them there themselves. This would empower families to have uh, choice. The second bill relating to education the senator is introducing is 2165, and this bill would provide access to extracurricular activities for homeschool students. Currently, homeschool students are not allowed to join in any of the sports, clubs, uh, theater, cheerleading, and this bill would allow those students to participate in the school they would ordinarily attend if they weren't being homeschooled. And it provides opportunities for them to do, take advantage of Running Start. That's a program that allows the upper level students in the secondary to take courses at the community colleges and receive those credits. We believe strongly it's important to return the power back to the people. Let them vote on issues that are important to them. Let them choose where they want their children educated and what curriculum that they think is best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kimberly. You notice that our theme throughout is choice. Uh, we believe that people, the consumers, the taxpayers, the parents should have many choices. Unfortunately, in Hawaii, we've made it a, a mantra to have no choice or lack of choice, monopolies in terms of what consumers can do. So we're trying to open that up. We also have a bill, for example, to de deregulate Hawaiian Electric Company, which is our number one monopoly in which everybody complains. You turn off the lights, you tell the kids to turn off the computers and still your electric rates go up. Why? Because this monopoly is involved in a number of programs such as Big Wind that people don't want and can't afford, an undersea cable, and we get charged for all of it. It's time to re-look at and examine the idea of electric and other power uh, distribution, particularly when we're talking about and patting ourselves on the back with alternative energy. There's nothing more precious than our children. Our children have been at risk. The risk has been growing. 
We have a package of bills that address, address that, so I'd like to call on our senior uh, attorney and director of research, Tisha Panner. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tisha Panter. As the Senator said, I'm the Director of Research down in the Senate Minority Research Office. Um, I just want to outline a couple of bills to you, a few bills. First of all, uh, the Senator mentioned the children and the elderly, which is uh, one of our priorities here in the Senate Minority. Um, the Senator indicated that um, ch children are of particular importance. In the past, child victims have spent um, considerable time waiting for trial. Uh, sometimes a year and a half, two years goes by before a trial occurs. And experts that we have consulted with indicate that this results in further traumatization to the victims because each time they come up close to a trial, they need to be reminded of their evidence and then the trial gets knocked off the calendar and it gets sent to another calendar further down the line in a few months' time. So here in the Senate minority, we've written a bill and the Senator has introduced that bill that gives children, victim children um, in the Bill of Rights, the right to move up uh, in the calendar and be given priority. So, um, and that's a very simple um, thing to do all it does is require the prosecutor to indicate to the court that they have priority uh, court cases. And we've also provided the exception that um, the court does not, uh, if, if there's a, an issue in regards to a person's trial coming on and they have a right to a speedy trial, then there's an exception the court can make and take the child to, say, number two spot on the calendar. The next one we've got is we're trying to overcome um, the 1995 court decision of the Supreme Court of Hawaii when they excluded child evidence being taken in a separate room. Um, we've introduced a, um, a bill that provides that a child's evidence can be taken, the interview of the child can be taken by a forensic um, interviewer or a police officer at the beginning, provided they don't ask leading questions and that that could be introduced in the child's evidence at trial. It would still mean the child is in the courtroom for the trial and subject to full cross-examination, um, and unfortunately we can't get around that provision, but it will allow, um, being, being that again, we've got time lapses, we've got young children that forget um, certain things over a period of time, it would allow their evidence to be coherent to the jury. The um, We've uh, also introduced in regards to children, um, there's uh, this first degree sexual assault provides for uh, a strict liability provision where if you penetrate a child under a certain amount of years, you're, you can be charged with first degree sexual assault. It exempts practitioners in their practice. The exemption is very broad and I'm concerned that um, a practitioner who might not be on the up and up and who violates um, the offence uh, could use that to get out of the strict liability provision. So we've tightened up that, but we've also included people in the exemption that need inclusion, such as midwives. You know, when they've got, a, they've got, um, uh, when they have to um, penetrate a child for medical reasons, um, such as physiotherapists who provide mm -hmm. internal when they have prolapses and things like that, they have to provide internal and stimula stimulation to get the muscles uh, working again. They haven't been, in, in the past, they haven't been included in the exemption, so what we've done is we've put them in the exemption as well. So um, if uh, someone wants to complain and um, request a prosecutor to, ch uh, to, um, to charge a person under that strict liability provision and they, um, and they get public support for it, um, it can't, this enables the, um, the strict liability pr provision not to be used unnecessarily. Okay. The uh, next one we have is elderly citizens, a very important subject. Elderly citizens, and I've seen it on the radio and the TV, or I've heard it on the radio and I've seen it on the TV, where we've got elderly citizens who have disappeared. And unfortunately, uh, later in life, of course, um, we lose some capabilities. Uh, to care for ourselves and this silver alert piece of legislation 
allows um, the police to put out, if they, they're concerned about someone's um, mental capacity and they've gone for a walk or a walkabout, as they would say in Australia, they can put out an amber alert, uh, well, they can, they can put out a silver alert and it, it piggybacks on the amber alert system. So it's almost no cost to the taxpayer to do something like this and care for our elderly. We next have issues of scams and privacy. Very concerning uh, right across the US is one called revenge horn, where people in a consensual relationship or in an intimate relationship consent to exchange photos and, um, and uh, revealing photos and revealing movies. When the parties break up, often one party out of spite will use that video or that photograph and post it for the world to see. People have lost jobs over it, they've lost families over it, and they've lost government positions over it. So what we've introduced is a bill that makes it an offence to um, post these photos uh, to the world and um, that hopefully will alleviate um, some of uh, those goings on because in the new age information gets out so quickly and once it gets on the internet you can't get it off. The next one we have is um, in regards to scams is uh, the fraudulent lien filing. In the US the FBI have reported an uptake of people, groups, filing fraudulent liens against public officials and including sheriffs and various other people to intimidate them to um, uh, and to harass them. So uh, we have f filed a bill, introduced a bill that provides that if you file a fraudulent lien to harass a public official, it's a class B felony. If you file a fraudulent lien to harass a general, uh, the general public, it's a class C felony. The reason why we've made the, um, the penalty so extensive is because it costs people tens of thousands of dollars to get rid of these liens. They have to go to court. Um, sometimes it can take a year and a half. They're, they've got their place up for sale and suddenly this lien is there and they don't have a clear title to sell. We've also introduced a, a, another bill which complements this bill, which is uh, under the Uniform Commercial Code, it will allow the Lieutenant Governor to receive statements under penalty of perjury and make a determination whether there's been a fraudulent lien filed. If there has, the, the Lieutenant Governor can remove it, um, provided notice is given to the person who filed the, the statement. And the other um, provision is that um, the Lieutenant Governor can reinstate a lien. Uh, so another thing the FBI reported, another issue, is that the um, people are uh, removing their mortgages fraudulently, selling their properties and skipping town. And we want to make sure that, that doesn't happen. Uh, I'll just finish up with just a couple of things. Um, one very important uh, issue the Senator is concerned with is improving the cost of living for the residents of Hawaii. One of the things the Senator is very concerned about is the, spy, the skyrocketing rates, electric rates, here in Hawaii. Per kilowatt, per hour, or per, per kilowatt hour, Hawaii is, is spending 36.81 cents, so almost 37 cents per kilowatt for electricity. In 2002, Hawaii was spending 16 and a half cents. And in 1996, Hawaii was spending 15 cents. Now, in today's age, Alaska is only spending 17 cents per kilowatt, their residents. Why are we, why are Hawaiians paying 20 cents more than Alaska? Alaska has to bring in their fuel. It's not like they have refineries up in Alaska providing their fuel on site. Why have we more than doubled in 10 years? 
So the senator wants to deregulate HECO. He wants to make sure competition comes in and the price comes down. And also, the facilities here are antiquated. They need to be upgraded. HECO can't seem to do it. So why don't we bring in outside competition that can do it? That's all I have at this time. Thank you. I have to make a, a statement for transparency. Uh, the silver alert was not um, uh, introduced because of me. I have not wandered off uh, as an elderly person. I'm still here, much to the chagrin of many of my colleagues here. Let me, uh, I, I think you can tell that first of all, our package is really thinking out of the box, well researched, uh, and different from uh, other bills that you've uh, read about or heard about or whatever. We're very serious about reform. We're very serious about allowing the people to be empowered again.